Good morning. Uh, today's is uh, May. No, yeah. Don't worry about it. It's fine. Good morning. Today is May 18th. My name is Jerry Gibbs. I'm conducting an oral history interview at Christ Episcopal Church in Waukegan, Illinois, with Richard Boomer. And uh, would you please state your name and address for the record? Yeah, Richard James Boomer, 2107 Ash Street, Waukegan, Illinois, 60087. And the time is uh, approximately uh, 9.40 a.m. Dick, let's start uh, by jogging your memory a little bit. Uh, were you drafted or did you enlist? No, I was drafted. I, uh, what happened is I originally I was in Fond du Lac, Wisconsin, and uh, I had completed a semester at the uh, University of Wisconsin-Madison. So I went over to Oshkosh, which was their nearest naval station, and I took the intelligence test and I passed that. And then they said, well, sorry, the selective service went in, so you have to go to Milwaukee. And I said, well, I want to be in the Navy. Well, they say, they said, give me, give them at the Navy unit what you started, and you should be ending up in the Navy. So that's what I did. When I went to Milwaukee, I gave them this uh, report. I said, I want to be in the Navy. And so that's where I ended up uh, going through the selective service system. Mm -hmm. And why did you join? What was your reasons for it? Well, <laughs> it brings back a lot of memories. Uh, our country was uh, sort of uh, in a bad mix. and Like, uh, I just graduated from high school, and a lot of my buddies in high school, they didn't, they came, they didn't finish the last uh, semester. December December seventh, nineteen forty one. Japan taught, so they uh, enlisted in, and you know they, our Fond du Lac school system gave them a diploma because of the fact that they were going into into the service, mm -hmm. and so I I went in because I and I wanted the Navy, because I didn't I didn't want to be uh, crawling around on, on the ground and all that. But little did I know in the future I was going to be doing that anyway. So. Mm -hmm. But it, and that was my basic, uh, I felt, my uh, country's need. Oh, that's great. Uh, do you recall your first days in the service? <laughs> yes. <laughs> we, went, uh, we went to Great Lakes Boot Camp. And, of course, they had different companies there. And I was in, I think we had, uh, well, of course, we were in the barracks. We had 60 on the first floor and 60 uh, recruits on the second floor. Well, I was on the first floor, and so uh, what happened is uh, when I got there, I ended up, uh, my first duty was I had to watch, you're given watches, and I had 12 hour, four hour watches. I had to, from 12 midnight to four in the morning at uh, watching the clothes unit where they, and it was hot, and here I was in that. So this continued for, I, I never got out of that. I, I was uh, in there for about uh, every every other day I was at 12 to 4. And so I got to the point where uh, I finally contacted uh, a fever, and that's the only thing. When I contacted the fever, that next night I was supposed to be going around the building. Outside, this was in February, it was about 20 below. Yeah, and, uh, yeah. Colder. So, uh, but, you know, it was the Navy, and then this is their introduction to uh, military life. So I, I accepted that. I, I met a lot of wonderful people, and uh, we all enjoyed each other as far as uh, group, as a group. Mm -hmm. And we would uh, go into the uh, big buildings there, and uh, we'd have... Uh, instructions as far as we got the Navy manual and then we went through that and uh, when we finished that we would graduate as a uh, apprentice seaman second class and then uh, after that I went to the hospital court school and that was uh, another eight weeks and so on and, and we had various classes there anatomy materia medica and uh, 
preparing us for uh, work as a uh, hospital corpsman. At that time, when I was in 43 to 46, we were classed as pharmacist mate. It was later that they changed the ratings to hospital corpsman. I mean, we're still hospital corpsmen, but we were classed as pharmacist mates. And so when I got out of there, I graduated from there, and I graduated to the top of the class, which meant that uh, they waited, and, and they, what they did then is they sent me to the uh, Selective Service Unit in Indianapolis, Indiana, the Navy part of that. And uh, that was when I was, so I was stationed there in Indianapolis, and uh, the post office was our Navy unit, and we were billeted in a YMCA in Indianapolis. And so we, we had various duties there. I, I was, one time I was uh, checking the eyes, one time I was uh, uh, drawing blood for some of the uh, in recruits. I know one instant uh, when I was in the Navy in the, in the uh, office, at the post office, they had a recruit there and they wanted him to draw blood, need to draw blood on the recruit. So I was getting ready to draw blood and some of my friends brought out an ear syringe, you know, a huge thing and <laughs> this guy thought I was going to use it. <laughs> so I get the tourniquet on, yeah. I, I get the uh, unit in there, I got my blood coming out and the guy passes out on me. So here I'm holding him up and I've got to take the tourniquet off and take, you know, but I did do it. But I, I said, thanks, guys, you're really helpful. <laughs> but uh, it was, uh, we had uh, a good report there. I mean, I enjoyed being in Indianapolis. It's a wonderful city. And I had a wonderful mate there. So, uh, as I say then, I was there for uh, about, let's see, oh, I was there for four or five months, I think. That, then I was, we were, uh, what we were going to do is they were starting a, a what they called military government G10. This was meant that we would go, if we went into an island, we would take care of the native population, medical aids to them. And we were uh, assigned to the 6th Marine Division. Now the 6th Marine Division, about 20% of their, uh, the Marines do not have any medical unit. The Navy supplies that. So then we went there to Okinawa, and uh, well, wait a minute, I got to back up here. I, I went, I went out to California for training there when we were uh, marching, and uh, this was in uh, yeah, okay, we were marching and, and uh, getting ready to go physically for a uh, movement there, and then in. Uh, Let's see. Then in April 1st, I went to uh, aboard ship. We in San Francisco, we, we boarded our ship was the USS Gage. And uh, this was something new because we had to, uh, to get to board our ship. At that point, they had this treasure island, which was allowed us to, it was the interior of the San Francisco Bay there. It allowed us to just walk onto the ship. And once we got on the ship, we had about 200 of us, and we were billeted in the, in the whole of the ship. We had about uh, 200 of us, and they had, uh, we slept, we had, uh, we had six, uh, what am I saying, six uh, bed, not beds, but six units for us to sleep. I was in the fifth one. So we started the, the ship, was a, as I say, it was a uh, troop ship. So we started out through Golden Gates and so forth, and uh, we the water was pretty calm. We went right by uh, Alcatraz, and when we went out to the bay there, and as soon as we hit that water, you know, this was all different ways. We were going all, and our first lunch there was spaghetti. and. Uh, the, you'd see the trays go down and this and go down. Mm. 
before we knew that, there's a lot of guys that were seasick. Yeah, they were throwing up yeah. all over the place, and, and it got so that when you went into the head, the stench was so bad that <laughs> that would cause you to, you know, not to like. But anyway, once we got going, we had to. We were going on our way down to the Solomon Islands, which was our staging area at Guadalcanal. Now, this prior had this was one of the first battles that they, the Americans did to moving up to, to uh, engaging the Japanese. And so on our way down there, we go across the equator, which was a very interesting object there. King Neptune came aboard the ship. Now anybody that goes through the equator has to go through this procedure. So what they do is they take, they have this canvas bag unit and they got chicken guts and everything else along the way there. And then you're crawling through that. And when you come out, they got sailors there with, with stockings and they're all wet. And you got your skivvies on you when you're underwear. Well, they beat the hell out of you when you come out of there. And, so, and then, of course, King Neptune stands there and his buddy is a great big hairy guy. And so this one guy really went berserk. He says, I don't want to do this. And that was the wrong thing to do. They had him kissing the baby's belly. <laughs> and uh, what happened is they had this, uh, before you went there, they had this juice unit that you were supposed to take a drink of. Well, the guy before me vomited in the juice. So I, I bypassed that. I wasn't going to take anything on that. But anyway, I, we got through with that, and it was a wonderful service. We, we were all then, you would get a plaque saying that you, you went past the equator. In other words, you went to a, to a polywog, to a shellback. This was your introduction. To, and then we, uh, when we landed on, on uh, Solomon Islands, of course, going on and off the ship, they had cargo nets. And you would line up six at a time, and you'd go down there into your landing craft. Well, they had told you, when you go down this cargo net, keep your hands on the uh, horizontal not the vertical, because somebody you put in there and somebody's coming down on you and is going to step on you. Well, one guy didn't that, and he fell into the landing craft, and they had to take him to the hospital there. Because, but uh, we finally, and of course, then we got on shore, and I would say that prior to that, Tokyo Rose knew where we were going. We didn't know where we were going, so she said, "You're going. The Sixth Marine Division is going to go." the Mariukus, and they won't have enough to muster in a phone booth with the Marines when they get through with them. And of course, when we went in there, uh, and on the way there, of course, they had typhoons there. And we had uh, just been on the edge of a typhoon, and our ship was refueling a uh, ship that was a submarine uh, tender unit. And they had... Uh, cans on the side, which they'd drop over, and then and it'd explode. Well, for some reason, we were up on deck talking with the group. We we used to sign that we had a doctor with us, and they had four corpsmen. We were watching. And for some reason, this ship cut across our bow, and we hit that back part of the bow. We didn't hit the tip. We had hit the tin cans and probably blown up the bow of the ship. But they... And then... We disabled the ship because of the fact that we hit the screws on the ship. But then, anyway, then we kept on going, and, and there were typhoons there. And we, we got uh, we landed on Green Beach Two, which was a northwest part of Okinawa. Right, uh, the air, they had an air base there. Kadena Airfield was right there, and so we were we were there, and so we had to transfer, get off the landing craft and go ashore and get on to the go to our uh, base unit where we were going to be on Nago. And it was very interesting. We had a Japanese truck that was coal, uh, used coal to, uh, instead of gasoline. And it was flatbed. Well, they put me on the, on the flatbed. Well, a couple times they'd go down the road and I'd fall off. So this one time I fell off, and here I'm looking at a armored vehicle coming right at me. 
you know, so I had to get out of there. So after that, they said, to keep you safe, we're going to put you up in the cab <laughs> so you don't fall out again. But anyway, we, we were set up with the medical units there. We had a nice uh, uh, unit as far as we had a big building. And over there, because of the typhoons, they get about 140 mile an hour winds. And they have thatched roofs. They don't have regular roof, thatched roofs would go right through. So uh, we were on there and setting up our unit. And of course, we had, uh, fortunately, we were able to get a, we needed an interpreter. And so we had this one older man that had driven taxis. He was Japanese, but he had driven taxis in, in uh, Honolulu. So, but he was on Okinawa. And so he was our interpreter. And then we had some uh, native women that some of them could speak English, you know, enough to know. And so with the doctor and the four corpsmen, uh, that was what our duties were. And uh, what, our, what our main duty was, we had a lot of babies being delivered, and so the doctors were delivering babies. But then, far more serious, they had the snake, the habu. And uh, with the uh, bombardment, they have uh, cement burial vaults. And these women, would, uh, peoples would go in these burial vaults, well, the snakes would be in there, and they'd bite them, hmm. and it it didn't it didn't poison them, but it did it sloughed off their their uh, skins. In other words, the skins we had a one of our patients was about a nine year old little boy. He came in, and his hand had fallen off, and they had the online radii exposed. But those people were used to that type of, so they knew what to do. But most of the after that, most of it was am amputation hmm. because of the fact that. Uh, yeah. Did you see any combat at all? You know what? Did you see any combat at all? No, we, we were so okay. far north. The 100,000 Japanese that were on uh, the island were down south. Okay. They were down at Naha. That was the capital down there. Mm -hmm. we, had, we, had, we were set up for uh, attacks. Uh, a couple of times they'd have uh, show, uh, mortars in at us or something like that, but no, we we were uh, we had we had carbines, and the officers had forty fives. But no. Can you tell me a couple of your most memorable experiences over there? Well, I think one of them for me was that uh, a young woman came in, and she had put a needle into her wrist. So I uh, took a scalpel and put in and made an incision and used the hemostat and went in and pulled the needle out. And so that, to me, that was, uh, I was happy I could do that because, you know, and it, in fact, the family was so delighted with what I had done that <laughs> the brother came and invited me to eat with their, well, they told us because of the fact that they use natural fertilizers that we shouldn't go and eat there because we would get, uh, I mean, we took a lot of shots before that to combat some of that. But, um, and then another time, I walked in and Dr. Frank Avilia was uh, busy. He says, check on that one woman and see how she's doing. So I walked in and the baby was starting to come out. So I proceeded to take the baby out, deliver the baby, tie off the umbilical cord and wait for the doctor to do that. That was uh, a couple of my experiences. And I'm just presuming then that you weren't a prisoner of war. No, no, I, okay. no, I was lucky. I mean, we, mm -hmm. I, I talked to my friend Gordon Worm. He was in the same hospital unit, but he went for. We went to the Solomon Islands for staging. He went to the Philippines, but initially enough, we ended up. We were on the uh, northwest part of the Okinawa. He was on the northeast part, and uh, we would, uh, as I said, we went around there in. Uh, during these hurricanes, uh, one of the, the, the Navy, they had these float panes. They had about eight float panes. And they went to this little uh, inlet on the northeast part, 10 of them. And when the hurricane came in, they thought it'd be safe, but it wasn't. Picked all those planes up and put them right on the shore. What did I do? I don't know. You're fine. So that, that was quite an experience. And as I say, when it rained there, it would be very muddy. 
we would be riding on the jeeps, and the jeeps would, you know, the mud was up to the hubs there, so what? Uh, it, uh, but uh, we we had uh, with our doctor units there, we we had quite an interesting. We had uh, four or five. Each each group had. I, our doctor was a general practitioner, and uh, then they had a dermatologist, a dentist. And you know it was a, a mixture of medical units, and uh, one operation I saw with the Dr. Frank Abita did. This older woman came in, and she was like she was pregnant, and Dr. Frank Abita says she can't be pregnant. So we went in there and opened. He opened her up, and she had a tumor. The tumor was, and you can't, you can't open a tumor and let it all go into the body. What he had to do is put a little incision there, and we had to drain that out, and we filled a couple buckets full of uh, bile from the from the unit. And when that was down there, well, then he could continue with the uh, uh, the procedure to take the tumor and fix her up. And another thing is we 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 ran out of uh, ether, so we had a chemist with it, and, and he we had a, a distilling unit. A very primary distilling unit, and if you take sulfuric acid and put it with ethyl alcohol, you can get ether. And so he tried that, and he, got, what he did is, with a, he couldn't fractionate that. If you had a fractionating, you could separate it. But initially, petroleum ether comes through, and then the ether. They're about 85 degrees. They're both about the same. And uh, so we used it, the doctor used this on the uh, one patient, and when he came out of it, he had a ring around his face from the from where the, because of the pet ether, it just sort of mm -hmm. put a little dent in his skin there. So it was it was rather interesting. But uh, as I say, uh, we did we did have a uh, quite a. Uh, a lot of experiences there with different types of uh, units. Uh, uh, were you awarded any medals or citations? No, well, I, I've got uh, Asiatic Pacific bar with a star, and then I think I got the, well, then I got the, the uh, Freedom and uh, Freedom Medal and uh, Overseas Medal, and you know, but that I didn't, I wasn't, didn't get any uh, personal. Uh, Okay. Yeah. Uh, how did you stay in touch with the family? Well, we I would write to my mother and father all the time, and of course, later later on, when during all this period, I would write to my mother and father. Later on, toward the, uh, I went overseas at forty five, but then they had the what they call these V email. You would write them, and then they'd photograph them, and then send them to your whoever you sent them to. And our, our letters, anything we wrote, were were uh, censored. So we couldn't tell our parents where we were, anybody. We couldn't tell them where you were or what you were going to do. And they told us that even before we went overseas, that, you know, don't tell anybody, don't give them any information as to where you're going. And then after, the, toward the end of the, when the war, I was uh, on Okinawa, on the northwest part. And then, of course, they dropped the A-bomb on Japan. And I was still on Okinawa, and we would have the Japanese plane bombers come over. And the interesting thing about them is that they would, instead of having a synchronizing motor, they would have it so it would sort of irregular, and it would wake you up. And you know, you'd say, "Oh, gee, they're going to drop bombs again." It was psychologically that's why they did that. And then, of course, then we had the. Uh, uh, the uh, one-way bombs. These guys would go one way. They'd get into the plane, and they would destructively go down there. And, and uh, we lost. And by the way, when we came to get to from Solomon Islands, we went up to Ulithi, which is about uh, two or three hundred miles from uh, Okinawa. And while we were there, they brought in the car carrier. Franklin. Now, Franklin had been basically destroyed. It was just a black hull, but they were going to tow it and try to repair it. So we, we saw that. And uh, as I say, when, when I got through with that, I decided that they sent me to Shanghai, China. 
And the reason I went to Shanghai, China, was that the Japanese had destroyed all the hospitals. You know, they didn't, hospitals didn't have anything to work with. So my job was to, to uh, work with the hospital people mm. and give them, uh, we'd bring up uh, things that they didn't have, refrigerators and, you know, everything that was completely, uh, so they could have a unit for the hospital. Mm. And one thing I, in Shanghai was kind of interesting. They have uh, they have heavy coolies and light coolies. Now they would they would have these uh, large uh, containers from the ships on there, and these heavy coolies would uh, they all get on one each in it, and they would actually lift these heavy cool the coolies that would lift the container and move it. It was amazing that we were able to do that, and uh, as I say. Their, their main, uh, I'm probably digressing, but their, their main menu was fish heads and rice. That was what they, they, they lived on. That's the type of food you have. Yeah. Yeah. And they, as I say, they, they, uh, they did very well as far as, and, and one thing is they had rickshaws there. Now, they, they had a, what they call a pedicab. That guy was like on a bicycle, and then you would sit on the back, and then you could go, but the, the rickshaw, the, the guy was pulling the rickshaw, and a couple of times, it was amazing. He would go when he tried to stop, the weight went on the back, and here the guy was hanging up in the air there. His little legs were going like heck, and he wasn't moving any place. So, and then I, uh, in walking around there, I uh, walked by the Russian embassy, and that was, that was a beautiful one. And of course, Shanghai, this was Shanghai, Czech was in charge of it there. And they had a racetrack there at the Shanghai. And this is one of the things they had, uh, the department store, which is the first time I'd seen an escalator. This was the, the uh, escalator on this department store. So that, I hadn't seen an escalator. So that was, uh, and that, of course, I got to use chopsticks. I could, I could eat with the chopsticks. Mm -hmm. so. You mentioned earlier about you had to make up some ether. You were, yeah. you know, you ran out of ether. Uh, did you have other problems with the, the no, supplies? No, well, the only stuff? other problem we had, because of the snakes, the Japanese had a lot of anti-venom there, but we didn't know how to use it because we had nobody that could really tell us what to, what to use. And so that was why we uh, weren't able to do it. And another interesting case, this woman came in with her husband and she had tet he had tetanus. Now, when you have tetanus, your jaws lock and you can't talk. And she was beating on her his neck. And the doctor says, what is she doing that for? Amazingly enough, about four days later, his mouth started to open. That constant beating. I mean, these women, these people there knew what to do in case of, you know, snake bites or stuff. You know, they, they tried to supplement their own medical units. Own rem remedies. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, but, uh, but it was amazing. Even the doctors were amazing that, that uh, this tetanus, because we didn't have any tetanus anatoxin. Hmm. So uh, uh, that was... Uh, Dick, did you uh, feel pressure or stress? Well, uh, you felt, I mean, you, you were in a foreign country, and we knew that at some time, the Japanese couldn't infiltrate. I mean, we had carbines and stuff like that, but, you know, somebody could have come in there and, and uh, uh, stolen everything we had. And then I had one incident, which was, we were all bonded, uh, Dodds and I, this was my friend of mine. We were, uh, we had a camp, we put a tent up in a camp and we were out on a field there with our, in, in Nago. And uh, this was toward night. Well, somehow I got away and he didn't realize it. And I was coming back and he had his gun faced right at me. And he asked me one question. He said, what are the Chicago Cubs? And I answered it. If I wouldn't have answered that right, I would have shot, been shot. Because, I mean, we were all, you know, we didn't know who was in the night. You didn't know. Because one of the times we had, we had canned, they had various foods that we had. We had canned foods. We had set it out. And they just snuck in and took the cans away, took the food away. I mean, they wanted something to eat. 
but I don't blame them. But, but uh, it was, uh, you know, you were under intention, the fact that you were in a foreign country, and you, you know, with the bombers going over you, and the uh, one man uh, going over, because they were going down to Naha and knocking out, the, and then, of course, along the say we had a picket line, which was destroyers all the way up there to prevent the uh, bombers from getting in there. And it's surprising. We lost a lot of people because of the fact that they, they'd send these uh, one-unit suicide bombs with us. And they, they, they knocked out a number of our ships, and we lost quite a lot of people because of the fact that these... Uh, and uh, as I say, they, they, with these one-way... One uh, bombers, you had a celebration, and your family wrote all the things, you know, how good you were, and you had to go and complete your, if you didn't complete it, one guy had trouble with his motor, and he came back, well, they darn near killed him, because you, you failed your mission, so he had to go out again, I mean, you, you know, they didn't have any choice, and then we were all, with the, with the A-bomb, we were all told that if we would have had to go into Japan, we would have lost about a million men. I mean, they would have, they had still had a lot of, in fact, they had a submarine that, in fact, when, when we went to Ulithi to pick up, we had an amount of 1,500 ships that went in there. We had more ships on there than they had when they went into Europe there. Well, destroyers, uh, in fact, George Van Pelt was on a, on a destroyer. And we we go back and forth and you know fire into the battleships, the destroyers. Every ship we had was firing into Okinawa. So it was. Uh, was there something special you did for good luck? Something unique. For good luck. Yeah. <laughs> well, I don't know. I said a few prayers. In fact, when we went in, we you know we were we were. I was an Episcopalian, so uh, it would put us in a Protestant class, so we could get anything. I'm not being sarcastic. We could get a Baptist, uh, Lutheran. You know, I think the only time I got a, a Episcopal priest was when I was called in and went to Bethesda, Maryland. The Bishop of Baltimore was Episcopalian, and he came in and served us. But other than that, it was all. But we didn't even have a service. Person, so one of the uh, men there said a small prayer for us before we went off because, uh, as I say, we didn't know nobody. I mean, well, incidentally, there's one thing that was really disturbing. This one Marine had talked to the doctor. He went up and told him, he said, This is my third invasion. I can't take this anymore. And the doctor says, Sorry, I mean, you can, you can do it. Well, I, our bunk, my bunk was here. His bunk was there. He took his M16, put it to his head, he used his foot as a trigger, and he blew his head off. So we had a burial at sea, and that is a. That's a very sad. It's a, something that you don't want to see too often. But uh, as I say, that that was. Very compelling. On a lighter note, how did how did you entertain yourselves? So be careful when you answer this question. <laughs> well, a lot of them had, uh, you know, on board ship they'd have cards and they'd have they'd poker and stuff like that. Um, on the land, when we were, you know, in our, we didn't have really much that much for entertainment. We would be walking around or something like that, but not, we couldn't go too much. We did have a, a, uh, a little sort of a pool, or not a pool, of a river. Anyway, uh, we, some of the staff and the, the native nurses and so forth, we went sort of swimming, you know, but that's about all the entertainment we had because we had to have somebody stand guard because we didn't know. I mean, if, if we, our guns were here and we were in the water. And uh, as I say, we, uh, and then it was what interesting, one of the, we had a doctor there who graduated from the Japanese medical school, and he, he was a medical doctor, and he, he was helping us too. But uh, as I say, we... Uh, 
of all the places you traveled over there, what stood out the most for you? What area? Well, I think the, the resiliency of the people, the Okinawan people, they had been under Japanese rule. And the, the Japanese told them, you, you socialize with the Americans, we're going to kill you. So they knew they couldn't do too much because they said, we'll come down at night and, and take care of that. Uh, but they were, they were very nice people. And it, it's just, their stability, I mean, our pain threshold is pretty slow and low. There's, you could, like I, I uh, did that operation I did with no, no anesthetic at all. And they're shocked. They would not, it was pretty hard for them to go into shock. So they, they would, uh, it was uh, fundamentally, uh, in fact, uh, recently they had a, a, quite a uh, advertisement for the diet of the Okinawans. It's a lot of protein so that these people live to be a hundred, a lot of them live to be a hundred years old because of the dieting. But it, it uh, you know, that was one of those things that, uh, it's amazing. They, they were they were all very uh, and one thing there the custom was that the woman always walked ten feet behind the man, and she would do all the work. We'd see these women come down with buckets of wood on their head, you know, hmm. or they'd have uh, pails and so. It was amazing uh, how the strength of the women. <laughs> I don't know, how, but uh, and then they they would prepare their food and and you know they went to everything. It was it was amazing the customs that uh, that they uh, same way with the, the Chinese when we were in Shanghai, China. They were they were very uh, Chinese. And of course, they were the Japanese desiccated the Chinese people. I mean, they, they went through there and killed everything, and it, it was terrible what happened to them. Uh, and then, of course, on Okinawa, one thing is that after you're buried one year, the daughter goes in and cleans your bones. The, the oldest daughter yeah. goes in and cleans the bones. So, so that they do have <laughs> customs that we certainly don't have. And they, of course, they, they uh, as I say, they, they, are, they are very wonderful people. I always felt they were quite wonderful. Do you recall any particularly humorous or unusual event that stands out? Well, overseas, I mean, we had this one guy, well, I shouldn't say, this one patient we thought was dead. So we had a hole, and we put him in a hole, and we started to put dirt on him, and he got up. <laughs> so that that was. Uh, I would think that's a. That was a yeah. that was a shock to the doctor because he said he said you know this guy's dead, mm. and we had, we had to bury him. Mm. But then when he gets up and walks around, mm. well, one of the other things that the uh, on the island on, on the Iwo Shima next to it, this is where they had the the uh, crazy people. And the people with, uh, what's this, uh, oh, why can't I think of it, uh, where their bodies are disfigured. Uh, Epilepsy? Yeah, epilepsy. Well, yeah, no. uh, uh, yeah, you said it. Leprosy? Leprosy, leprosy yeah. yeah. They had leprosies there. And we had a whole family come. And it was very sad to see it. I mean, you know, they're, they're, they're really disfigured. And uh, but we couldn't help them. We, I know in, in uh, Louisiana they have leprosy, and they were using sulfur drugs. I mean, until I mean, you know, it was just one of those things. But it was a very sad thing to see the whole family was 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 uh, fix, affected by this. And it was very sad, hmm. and especially when you couldn't do anything for them. Overall, Dick, do you have any photographs? Uh from the war? Or? I did have, but I asked my daughter, I said, where did it go? I, I had a, a book of uh, photographs of, of what I had, where my uh, episodes in, in uh, overseas and in the recruiting unit and everything else, but I'm going to have to look again, but I, I can't find it. Do you keep a personal diary with that? or No. I, uh, I mean, uh, my diary was all the letters I wrote to my parents. Okay. But uh, my mother and dad, you know, my mother said, well, uh, once I got back safely, why, the, you know, there wasn't any 
Some people keep them, but we didn't keep them. Mm -hmm. In the photographs, who were some of the people? Well, remember? I had some of our crew there, our doctors, and some of the patients. And, of course, with these typhoons that we had, we're at 140 miles an hour. This one typhoon, what happened in the, in the sea, they had this uh, aircraft carrier where the wind, wind was and the waves were so high, the forward deck for uh, launching was pushed back. And then when they built these ships in California, the, the cargo ships and the ships we were on, they were in sections. Well, one section, one ship lost the front section of the bow. Oh. And so they, but because they were sealed, they could still move around. So it, it was uh, those typhoons were, in fact, one, one time we had a little hole in, in this one window that we had. And that typhoon was coming in. And I stood up to look out and it blew me over. I mean, right through that little hole. And that's why those homes had thatched roofs. Because if you had a regular roof there, why the roof would go? So that, uh, and we, we had a tent we had for our patients, but that blew the tent over. So mm -hmm. you had to be very, uh, very careful. With, uh, what did you think of your officers and fellow soldiers? I thought they were very wonderful. I mean, our doctor, Dr. Frank Avino, was outstanding. I mean, he, he was uh, unbelievable. All the doctors were, uh, I thought they were all first rate. We had a dentist there. And I, I don't know whether he, I don't know what his function was. And then, initially enough, we had a guy that was a, a uh, uh, coroner, assistant coroner in New York. He had an MD and everything else. But he would not touch anything unless it was dead. The person had to be dead. Or he, hmm. he wouldn't help us at all. He wouldn't help the other doctors. So, I mean, it was a shock. Here he was an MD, he could have done anything, but you had to be dead. For some reason. Yeah. yeah. So that was one of the things that really, yeah. <laughs> you wonder, oh, human nature, I mean, here he's got people that really need medical help, mm -hmm. but uh, he didn't do it. Do you recall the day your service ended? Yeah, I was, oh, that's another thing. I was there, I was in Shanghai, China, and this was for Christmas and New Year's. My parents, my mother, my mother and dad sent me a telegram for Happy, happy New Year's. Mm -hmm. It was very, I, I never forgot that. That was fantastic. I didn't, you know, I was getting letters, but to get a telegram in China. China. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, another, another thing is in China, the uh, rate, when I was there, one American dollar was worth 100, 100 Chinese dollars. Later on, it got to the point where uh, one American dollar was worth 2,000, 3,000. Because they had three different, they had a rebel, the rebel currency, they had the regular Chinese currency, and then they had the government. You know, it, it was so sad that I, when I first got there, this one guy had a bunch of bills. I thought, boy, these guys are pretty wealthy. Turned out he probably had 10 cents <laughs> as far as that goes. Yeah. But it, it was uh, unbelievable, yeah. the fact that uh, the currency had gone so so radically, which is true in a lot of those, where you got in a mixed. Because as I say, when I was in China, Chiang Kai-shek was in charge. Mm -hmm. But then, uh, as I say, uh, after uh, the communists got in there, well, then it was entirely different. Mm -hmm. And I, I would see, we would see the uh, Chinese uh, military go down there, and that was pretty sad. I mean, they, they, they had a, it was rudimentary ammunition. I mean, they, they didn't, they, it was so sad that they, they couldn't stand, I mean, they couldn't face any, any, anybody of, uh, you know, with the communists, they had no chance at all. I mean, these guys had guns and these people were running around with, with very little, any guns they had were so ancient that they wouldn't do any good. So it was, it was quite an eye awakening. I know when I went back home, I said, "Boy, I'm I'm certainly happy I'm living in the United States." What did you do in the days and weeks afterwards? Well, when I got home, I I was planning on going to the University of Wisconsin. I got home in 
in January. And uh, I, the, the summer courses were starting, and I started in the summer course. So then I, I went back to University of Wisconsin. I, uh, with, the, with the GI Bill, I completed it, and graduated as a chemist. And I, I started out in 1943. I took one semester, and uh, it took me uh, six years to get through. By 1949, I graduated. So I, because of the three years that I had in, in the world war. But I, I would have to say the GI Bill was very wonderful because I, I couldn't have uh, uh, taken bill. You know, I didn't have the money to put myself through college. I know when I went, when I went down there before I went into the service, I was working at the, uh, trying to get a, a job at the, I was living in a, uh, the houses. They had people, you could rent a house, I mean a room, and go to class. Well, I, I went to the union there and got a job as a pin setter for the bowling. Hmm. And I, 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 you know, I, I didn't seem all right with one, but then they gave me two alleys. And after about two weeks of that, I could hardly, you know, so I said, I got to get out of here. I'm, 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 I'm never going to finish the semester with my back. So then I went to the dish room. So that, that's, uh, then I, I worked that way. Huh. Because when I went to the University of Wisconsin in 1942, the semester was $75. And when I went there, I had $75 because as a junior, I was a busboy in a hotel rent law. And as a senior, I was out at the golf course, South Hills Golf Course. And I, it, it was a, a caddy would get 50, 75 cents, a B caddy would get 50 cents. I'd get, I'd get 50 cents. And it, I would sometimes would double caddy. Well, it was all right if you had them good. But a couple of times I got one, the guys all over here. And by the time you had two and you were running all, it was. But it was, I met some wonderful people in, in the golf. In fact, one of the teachers there, Mr. Fruth, was was very wonderful. I mean, he, I'd carry his bag, and you know, it was very wonderful. And we had one. It was interesting. They had one doctor there that, when he had a divot, he'd take it home, and put it in his yard. So, <laughs> I mean, you ran into all kinds yeah. of. You know, speaking of that, uh, did you make any close friendships while in the service? Well, yeah, I, 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 I did, but I, I sort of lost contact. So with you haven't continued with those no, friendships. No, no. I mean, well, Gordon Worm was, was, uh, he was from Fond du Lac too, and he, we were uh, roommates. He was in a pharmacy school. I was in a chemistry school, and so he got out. He was a pharmacist in Fond du Lac, and of course, I was a chemist. But I, I had to, uh, I ended up with Abbott. Yeah. Uh, First time I, uh, when I got out, I, I graduated in 49. I went to uh, a small, at that time, Wisconsin had about 250 small breweries, and of course, then they had Paps, Slits, and all the big ones. Well, this company took care of, they had two, uh, two uh, units there, a pharmaceutical and a, a uh, brewery. And so uh, I was in the pharmaceutical part there. So it, it was that was kind of interesting because the major brands were all everything was and analytically they were perfect all of them but those uh, those little breweries where they had a master brewer some of them were pretty sad yeah. but the local people that's all they had so they thought that was good beer yeah did you join a veterans organization yeah I'm a member of the American Legion. I'm also a member of the American Chemical Society. I've been that for 60 years, I think. Yeah. And you mentioned you became a chemist in... Uh, in uh, 1949. And uh, uh, joined Abbott's. Yeah. This and is... Uh, how many years ago with Abbott's? Well, I had 34 years with Abbott. Mm -hmm. I started out uh, 1952 and uh, worked... Uh, I was married in 53, so then we moved to Waukegan. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but as I say, that, that uh, time I spent with a little lab in, in Milwaukee, and uh, you would, trying to get a, 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 I would think I was getting a dollar an hour. 
And uh, if you wanted five cents or something, no. But the man that owned the thing, he was amazing. He he had he had a cooperage. Uh, in one word, he made barrels, and then he had this small lab here, and he would throw his chicks stubs in the waste basket. We had one lady there; she had to clean them up. He was making more. He was put, his people paying more taxes than he was paying his people. Hmm. And the amazing thing about it, he had a, a, these dogs that were white-haired. Well, they sheared the dog's hair off, and his wife had a coat. And then he he was eating a steak, and he choked to death. Oh, so it, uh, terrible. But he was, he was uh, you know, this one guy went from his small lab to the Brass Brewery, and he put a note on the, this is what happens the, the higher caliber go elsewhere, the, the weak will <laughs> stay here. Yeah. So, yeah. but uh, as I say, you run into all type. I, I enjoyed my time at Abbott. Uh, yeah. I was a chemist there and had laboratories, and uh, we we were, did a lot of stability work, and, and you had a lot of instrumentation. That uh, you know, when I started out, about all that we do it titrate and we would write it on cards. Well, then we got this FDA and we had to put, calculate and put run standards. We had a gas chromatography and a, a high, high, high velocity chromatography. You had to run standards and then sample standards and sample. Yeah, that was, uh, you even had to calibrate the, the uh, thermometer you had in the, in the refrigerator. So it was, you know, with the FDA, we're, you got to be very, very careful because yeah. they could wipe you out. In fact, we are our illustrious leader there. He said, I got it in with the FDA. So every time the FDA wanted money, they came in and they, they, had, they got $25 million four times because of his stupidity. He's still having it in the FDA. Yeah. I mean, uh, still having it in the FDA. Dick, I'd like to ask you, uh, did your military experience influence your thinking about war or about the military in general? Well, I knew, unfortunately, for the last thousand years we've had wars, so I didn't think that we were ever going to. And I have a friend now, a very wonderful friend. He's a captain in the, uh, he went through ROTC and he's a captain in the uh, Army. And, uh, no, I, I, uh, didn't like it, but I don't see any way about it. I mean, with the po politicians get us into a lot of trouble. I mean, if they leave their their hands out of it, uh, let the military do their job. But uh, it's a sad commentary on, on our uh, politicians. I mean, the, the uh, Congress or whatever you have, they they're very sad. I'm, <laughs> I certainly am not too happy with the present uh, situation we got there. If, you know, you said you uh, belong to the Veterans Organization, uh, what kinds of activities does your post or association have? Well, they, they probably have a, I, I'll be quite frank with you, I, I do not go to the meetings. I, I just don't. I, I belong to another one, the City Club of Waukegan, mm -hmm. and that I very faithfully go to. We have meetings on first Tuesday and thir third Tuesday, and I go to that all the time because it's, it's, uh, for some reason, this is, I know the American legions and all these units have gone down so. I mean, when I first started out with the city club, we had over 100 people there. Now we got 20. And the moose is gone. All these all these uh, wonderful units are gone. Yeah. But I, I do like, uh, the next meeting on Thursday, we're going to have a, an FBI man that was working with Boston at, on that uh, Terrible day when they had all those bombings. America. And we have very interesting people that come and talk to us. And you see, we, we have, um, it, for me, that's that's my fulfillment. And then, of course, I have a coffee unit that I go. We're all veterans of World War II. And then every Monday, we go to the Sunset uh, Restaurant and have coffee and talk for about from 9.30 to 10.15. Mm -hmm. It's kind of interesting because we're all... Uh, all uh, veterans of World War II. Is there any uh, additional reunions from from your unit that you get together from time to time? Or no, uh, no. 
Some people get together, but I, with my medical unit, uh, no, we, we, we never. How did your service and experiences affect your life? Well, of course, my whole life, I, initially, I grew up in a depression. I was, my dad worked for one day a week. So I was, you know, we had entertainment, we did entertain ourselves. My mother had three sisters and we were in Fond du Lac. My dad had another sister in, in uh, Milwaukee. But we would always get, get together. We all lived on Scott Street. And I know you don't know about it, but it was a main, and it was right near Lake Winnebago. And of course, with Lake Winnebago, I loved to ice skate and I loved to swim. Most of the people there are into hunting and fishing. But to me, it was, we had a high school swimming and, and uh, but then Lake Winnebago was, uh, they had roopings leather and they dumped all their refuge in the water and of course it contaminated everything so you couldn't go. But they had a beautiful park there and I could go uh, ice skating on the each channel there. Mm -hmm. And that's what I loved. I mean, I, I would be out, and of course, we had, in the, in the Depression there, they had rinks, ice rinks. And they'd have a shanty there, they'd have hot cocoa and music. And then, but you could swim, skate, ice skate. Mm -hmm. And it was very wonderful. I mean, that, uh, to me, that was, yeah. and as I say, we, I, 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 my first radio was a crystal set mm -hmm. in, in, uh, the, the, in Fond du Lac, the KFIC, I had to listen to the crystals. Mm -hmm. And of course, then as the radios got bigger, we, we finally got a different type of radio. But, uh, and then I I, uh, I would say, I loved the big bands. And uh, my dad got me a pass so I could go from Fond du Lac to Milwaukee. At the Riverside Theater, they'd have all the big bands. Mm -hmm. I'd go there. They'd have, the band would play first, and then they'd have two movies, and then the band again. So I'd sit through all that, and I saw a lot of wonderful bands. Warren Tucker, uh, Sammy Kay. Uh, well, of course, then when we were in the service, we always had, in fact, uh, one of the uh, major bands in, in uh, Chicago was, uh, had his whole band went into the service, and he, he played for us. And then, they, of course, they had... Uh, uh, some of the bands that came over to entertain, you know, Bob Hope was, I, mean, I never got to see Bob Hope, but uh, it was always a wonderful yeah. feeling. So the experience of the war, though, how did that affect you afterwards for your life? Well, of course, I will, I will tell you that uh, when I, I, I graduated from hospital corps school, I spent, before I was assigned to Indianapolis, I spent night duty. And we were getting some of the guys back from Guadalcanal. And uh, those guys would wake up and screaming and everything else. It was pretty sad. Mm -hmm. So uh, I knew what happens, you know, when you're engaged with the, some of these guys would be in a hole and the Japanese would drop in them. You know, it was uh, terrible to see, hear some of those things. Mm -hmm. So, but uh, no, I, I, as I say, I felt that uh, it was a privilege to help my country out. I met some wonderful people. And uh, as I say, I don't like war, but uh, what are you going to do? Mm -hmm. Is there anything you would like to add that we have not covered in this interview, Dick? I'll probably get home and think I'm saying it, but no, I think I covered about everything I, I can't. Uh, I know my mother and dad were, were very... Uh, receptive of me going into the service. In fact, <laughs> my mother and dad came out to, to visit me at Great Lakes in between the boot camp and halfway you can, parents can come to the conference room. Well, the, the, the day they came, I had spent from 12 to 4 working in the kitchen. So I fell asleep <laughs> and my, my mother went home crying. She said, what are they doing to my son? <laughs> of course, she didn't say anything to me, but she, my dad told me that after that. And I think one thing too that happened to me was my father, uh, when I got back uh, and was going to the university, he was working out in Milwaukee. He took the train and I was walking down, I was a Saturday class, I was walking down there and who, 
what are the chances of your father meeting you on a university campus? And then we walked together. Huh. <laughs> and I said, that was quite wonderful. I mean, you know, it was uh, mm -hmm. very touching. Mm -hmm. And then I, I said, well, Dad, I can't, I can't walk back to you to train. I got a class I got to go to. Mm -hmm. I should, I could I didn't want to cut it because I'm... Dick, you, you were uh, talking about your uh, surprise uh, visit from your dad on campus. You were yeah. finishing up with that. Yeah. And how great that was. Oh, yeah, that was wonderful. As I say, my parents uh, always uh, supported me in, in my decision to go to. In fact, when I was in the war, uh, I was in the reserve in 1946, and so when I graduated in 49, that was when Truman extended the reserve for another year. So I ended up being recalled, and because of my fact that I was a chemist, I ended up in the National Navy Medical Center in Bethesda, Maryland, and I was in the chemistry department there. And that was very interesting because we, we uh, took care of uh, uh, I, well, I was uh, one of the things was we would have we had this base in North Carolina where these sailors were getting drunk, and then they'd fall into the pool, and they drowned, and so we would have to check chemistry, and so we would get samples from their brain and samples from their lungs to check and see if they if they drowned in a pool. The clues normally have chlorine, so we can pick up the chlorine there. If we didn't find any chlorine, then it was dead before. But some of those guys, their alcoholic content was way high. And then I think we had this one woman that, that uh, well, anyway, we, we had a number of cases there that were really interesting. But it was wonderful working with that area because this is where the presidents came, and, and uh, you know it was a. In fact, the the edifice in uh, Bethesda is part of the same edifice that uh, Great Lakes built, or you know. So they put the Navy and the VA together with this one building, and it's sort of a copy of that because that that was uh, quite interesting. One last thing I'd like to just to add, and you can. Uh kind of uh, visit with us about you because of knowing you that you you have done uh, special work uh, during summer sometimes down oh, yeah. down south it, yeah well see my, uh, my son as a result of your yeah my son-in-law had a, a con southern Illinois is very poor and they don't have any medical units so my son-in-law is a pain specialist and he he would go down we would go down there to Thebes, which is right near uh, Mississippi River. And we would set up a camp there. He, in fact, he bought a farmhouse and then added to it two, because he, we had about, he had, he, in fact, he had a 15 passenger bus, because we get a lot of volunteers, because we needed volunteers down there. So then we'd all get on the bus and, uh, Thursday and, and get ready for Friday and Saturday, because we'd have, 250 patients on, on uh, Friday and 250 on Saturday. And so we had five or six doctors there. So it was uh, very interesting because, uh, as I say, he built this up and, and uh, the, there was no cost. I mean, they, they could, if they wanted to give some the money, they could do that. But this, he was in, he's in pain management. It's prototherapy. In other words, if you have problems with your uh, knees or your back, which I have had. I've had prolotherapy to my back a number of times from him. And it's wonders. It does uh, wonders. It helps me completely. And the knees. And so he's uh, he's been doing this for, I don't know, 20 years or so. He's, and then, of course, he's got his main office in Oak Park. And he's got a number, great number of patients. But that was very interesting because we'd have all these volunteers that would come down, and we had to have food, and, and uh, the wonderful people down there would help us too. So it was uh, a, uh, quite an experience to talk to these people and see that, and in fact, one case there, the woman was told by her doctor, she was in a wheelchair, 
and we can't do anything with you. I mean, you're, you're going to spend the rest of your life in a wheelchair. And Ross gave her about four or five treatments, and she didn't need a wheelchair. I mean, it's amazing that what he can do with, with his pain management. Well, Dick, I'd first of all like to thank you for your time to come and uh, tell your story to us. Yeah. And secondly, and most importantly, again, thank you for your service. Yeah, well, thank you. Thank you for your, <laughs> your spending time with you, you people. And the time now is approximately 1047. Thanks so much. Very good, Dick. I didn't even have to hardly add. You were running right down, right down the line with the questions. Yeah, there very good. I mean, I'd written it down. Yeah. Well, you keep that. Well, you keep, well,